So I'd like to introduce a, a couple of folks that are leaders in our community and have been uh, working on uh, some of the trauma issues that our community has been, been working through and healing from. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, Reverend Nicole LaMarche. She's the pastor of the Community United Church of Christ. It's a congregation that includes Boulder County. And since we have Zoom, it's well beyond and is based in South Boulder near the Table Mesa Shopping Center. And she's a spiritual entrepreneur and a public faith leader. She serves the United Church of Christ churches and she has served in Massachusetts uh, before co-founding the Urban Sanctuary, a church of progressive Christians, agnostics, spiritual independents, and other people of conscience in San Jose, California. Nicole has a Bachelor's of Arts in International Studies from the University of Arizona and a Master's of Divinity from the Graduate Theological Union of Berkeley, California. She's committed to creating beloved community beyond the confines of church and was a part of the Occupy Oakland movement and later the Black Lives Matter movement. It's ongoing. And Nicole is currently an active leader with Together Colorado including work organizing for climate and economic justice, ending gun violence, and more. And also with us today is Susan Bellis, who is a licensed professional counselor. And she's uh, Mental Health Partners Regional Director for Broomfield and East Boulder Counties. She is part of the executive team that developed M uh, MHP, or Mental Health Partners Response to the Tragedy at Table Mesa. And she's taken shifts offering counseling and care to those directly affected by the shooting at Table Mesa Shopping Center. She's provided mental health treatment for the last 33 years, 27 of those years as a leader and trainer in the field. And Susan has a passion for working with kids, teens, and families, especially those overcoming the challenges of trauma, attachment, substance abuse, uh, and then abuse and neglect. She leads group doing groups rather doing attachment work and building skills, especially those with DBT treatment model. And Susan recently was recognized by Broomfield uh, with the Heart of Broomfield Service Award and as Broomfield's 2021 Healthcare Hero. Go, Susan. <laughs> All right. Thank you for being here and Look forward to hearing what you have to say today, both the Reverend Nicole and Susan. It's Rich. Thank you, healthcare hero, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful to have been invited to be a part of this uh, conversation uh, today. Um, it's a privilege to be here with you and to learn from our time together, even in preparing for this, I already uh, feel like I've learned uh, a lot. So I'm coming today, um, not as an expert, uh, more like a survivor, I'm aiming to partner and parent and pastor with intention in a time that is asking and continues to ask a lot of us mentally, physically, and emotionally. I'd like to begin uh, as is part of my uh, practice for staying uh, awake and alive and connected in the world um, to let yourself breathe in peace and breathe out stress. I once heard uh, Rabbi Sharon Brouse say that we can't let ourselves become breathless. Uh, God's very name is breath, spirit, life. So I invite you to breathe in as you're moved and then uh, I'll chime uh, from uh, the meditation bowl and then share a poem um, called Where the Breath Begins. And in my tradition, one of the metaphors for a really hard time is a wilderness time. And so that's kind of the spirit um, of the poem. Dry and dry and dry in each direction. 
dust dry, desert dry, bone dry, and where in your own heart dry. The center of your chest, a bare valley stretching out every way you turn. Did you think this was where you had come to die? It's true that you may need to do some crumbling, yes, that some things you have protected may want to be laid bare, yes, that you will be asked to let go and let go, yes. But listen, this is what a desert is for. If you have come here desolate, if you have come here deflated, then thank your lucky stars that the desert is where you have landed. Here, where it is hard to hide, where it is unwise to rely on your own devices, here where you will have to look and look again and look close to find what refreshment waits to reveal itself to you. I tell you, though it may be hard to see it now, this is where a greatest blessing will find you. I tell you, this is where you will receive your life again. I tell you, this is where the breath begins. Those are words from Jan Richardson. Thank goodness for the artists and poets to get us through. So even before the massacre on March 22nd, we have all been living with the grief and trauma of a pandemic that has brought us myriad unveilings of hard truths. And I know for me personally, this has brought a lot of grief to see the truth about everything from our healthcare system to our economic system, to our educational system, to our system of policing and public safety. And even um, before all of that, we were beginning to endure the trauma and grief of climate breakdown, which has brought fires and floods and more uncertainty uh, about what life on planet Earth together will be like. So I feel that in some places, our baseline level of anxiety has been raised, which means for some of us, the default can be a constant state of reaction, uh, which is I've observed what wounded creatures do. And so I, I'm kind of approaching this that many of us are actually wounded. Uh, maybe you already know that the root um, of the word trauma from late uh, 7th century, 17th century Greek, it literally means wound. And so I believe that we are wounded mentally and spiritually, individually and collectively. And I think many of us really understand this in some way. So even as we wander around kind of wounded, I've also heard over the course of the pandemic, an expression of not wanting life uh, to go back, wanting to claim a new normal. And so for me, part of the grief of March 22nd um, was feeling as if that was a normal, that was the old life, that was something we said um, wasn't going to be again. I've heard people call this a chance for a rethink, a new doorway, a new path, and those in my own community know um, I've referred to um, the writer Arundhati Roy, who has called this pandemic a portal. And I really love that. And she writes that it has cast a different light on our lives. And it forces us to question the values that we've built our whole modern societies on, what we've chosen to worship, what we've chosen to cast aside. And so she speaks about this as a, a this portal as a chance to go through to another world. So we are wounded and that feels fragile. And I know I'm not the only one that has felt that. I've heard that expressed quite a bit. And a wash in grief, I've also felt myself a little um, less patience with denial of all kinds of things. I've noticed um, people are less likely to say everything's fine now when I ask how are you doing? There's sort of a, a strip down an honesty um, that this time has brought uh, for us. And as I've shared in my own household and in my own congregation, for many of us, this time of grief um, has invited us uh, to be open to change, 
from everything from, you know, growing your hair out or um, gardening more. Um, this has manifested in all kinds of ways I'm observing. And so my first offering today is that if we accept that we are wounded and grieving, this means that we also must be open to the shiftings inside of us and around us. And sometimes the changes that emerge uh, are surprising. So it's okay to let uh, change be a part of discharging your pain. That's how I think of it, um, discharging our pain. On Sunday, March 21st, uh, we had hosted the brilliant Avani Dilger, which is a local um, leader in her, she works uh, with an organization called Natural Highs. And that day she had started to teach us about uh, some of the latest neuroscience on addiction. And she introduced to us um, some of the newest research uh, that tells us that while some are more inclined, um, addiction is often better understood as a response to trauma. And until we are able to tell our stories and live new ones through therapies and movements and treatments and until the pain uh, from abuse or struggle or harm is transformed, addiction is one way that people kind of try to resolve that pain. And so we had had that conversation on Sunday, March 21st. When the massacre happened the next day, I thought of what we had learned and how all of us now surrounded and soaked in pain. We wept learning that one of the victims was Officer Tally, the one who had shown up on my doorstep last June when our church was assaulted and was the victim of hate crimes. And we wept more knowing in my own family that a biggest fear of moving to Colorado was gun violence and my daughter being harmed by this thing that we have decided is acceptable. And I began to ponder how I and the church could do more to discharge our pain based on what we had learned the day before. Gabor Mate, who's one of the leaders in this new way of thinking about addiction, not wrote, not all addictions are rooted in abuse or trauma, but they mostly can be traced to painful experiences. A hurt is at the center of all addictive behaviors. It's interesting to think about these harmful things for individuals and com com communities as a failure to discharge pain or to deal with a painful experience at the heart of it. On Monday, March 22nd, I was driving back from a day of snowshoeing in Rocky Mountain National Park when our family received an alert of an active shooter and multiple casualties. My colleague and I were frantic, <clears throat> aiming to communicate with all of our people in the neighborhood and later frantic all over again when we learned who the victims were. We immediately held a vigil on Zoom and we attended vigils throughout the neighborhood. And then some of us the following week attended a local demonstration on Good Friday with Raw Tools, a Colorado Springs based nonprofit that works to literally turn guns into garden tools. It planted a seed for spiritual healing and we took turns, the group of us who came, pounding hot metal shaped by heat, inspired by Isaiah, they shall turn swords into plowshares. Later, we offered healing for the body, again, bringing Avani Dilger to lead us in Acu Detox, which is the first for me on our terrace doing acupuncture as we meditated to the sounds of bird songs and the rushing creek. This was a way for us to open up internally. I confess I was skeptical, but it was a beautiful experience and even the conversations afterward were healing. My colleague, the Reverend Jackie Hibbard hosted and continues to host gatherings for our people with her horses, where our community is invited to meditate with the animals and to tune in and learn from them, sensing our wounds. As a faith community, we are a place both of contemplation and action. So in addition to our worship services on Sunday, we have something called breathing space, where a group of us gather Tuesday and Thursday mornings at 730 to sit in silence together. I believe that silence, whatever name you have for it, tuning into it is extremely healthy and I wish more medical practitioners would prescribe it. Side note. <laughs> And the, another learning for me in this time 
is remembering all over again that discharging our pain can come from movement. In our context, we offer walkly weekly meetings and spiritual hikes monthly. And we also host labyrinth walks on our property, inviting people from our community and the neighborhood to move their bodies at a pace that works for them. I understand that maybe the more professional term now, the fancy term that's used is called uh, behavior or um, some kind of movement activation, uh, but really it just get your body moving. It's good for your soul too. Over the course of these weeks and months, we have found ourselves asking <clears throat> what it would be like to become a trauma-informed church. What would it be like to build a culture that invites people to discharge their pain individually and their own healing also, so it doesn't ripple out to all of us. It wasn't lost on us that the suspect was bullied in school. So whether it be from war or from the loss of a job, from divorce or a hard time, what would it look like for our communities to be healthy places to heal the wounded among us? Part of what we have learned is making space for people to be in different places with their grief. Some people have needed more time alone and some have needed more connection. And we have started to create banners and collaging, asking people what they've lost over time, what they've gained, allowing art to be a place for people to express. For some of us, discharging our pain needed more than thoughts and prayers. And we were frustrated with that continuing to be shared, especially by those in political office. So under the umbrella of our Social Action Commission, we hosted numerous listening circles within our church to learn how we could respond to March 22nd beyond thoughts and prayers. At one of our vigils, we heard nothing will change, and we felt moved to prove that wrong. In addition to continuing to lobby efforts to ban assault weapons, we agreed to move ahead with the idea of collaborating with Raw Tools and Mike Martin to host a gun buyback event that would offer healing for us and for the whole community. Last week, our coordinating council blessed the Guns to Gardening Tools gun buyback event and allocated $10,000 to be used to as a challenge match to the $10,000 we had already received, which means we already have over $20,000 for this effort. And just this week on Wednesday late, we heard the exciting news that the Colorado, Colorado Attorney General's office has approved our proposal to host a Guns to Gardening Tools buyback event on Sunday, June 13th in coordination with the Boulder Police Department. We are really grateful to Officer Trujillo and to Commander Yamaguchi and others who are continuing to connect us with those uh, who are helping to make it happen. Our big dream is to get 500 guns out of rotation, preventing suicides, uh, reducing the number of military style weapons in population in our population and you know, shifting the culture uh, around what it means to keep one another safe. Um, it'll also be a chance this event Part of what happens is the physical and spiritual mental transformation of literally turning guns into garden tools. And so that'll be one of the demonstrations that happens later in the day. And we invite um, all of you to come to that 2650 Table Mesa Drive. In closing, I really do believe we are bound together and the pandemic has shown that fact, really, even if we deny it. This means that even the pain and trauma that we hold individually is something that all of us might need to feel responsible for, because if it's not transformed, it harms the whole world in a way. It is a powerful invitation to take responsibility for one another, to own our own pain, and to own the pain collectively we hold in a, as a society and to seek out and convene healthy ways for all the communities in which we inhabit to be a part of transforming trauma too. So my charge to you, let yourselves be changed by this and let others show up differently. Let yourself and let all of us collectively imagine new ways of being together. And let others show up differently. Whether it is celebrating your new beard or your new body or your new commitments, as we say in our church, let yourself sing a new song. Second, 
Move and groove your way through pain, whether it is walking or biking or dance class or gardening. Find ways to activate your body as you are able. Third, let silence be your friend, a companion you might seek out. Whether you call it meditation or prayer or quiet time, I invite you to sit in silence or meditate at least long enough to get beyond your to-do lists. There's no right way. Even five minutes will put you ahead. Fourth, do art or make or build something that you think is beautiful or delicious or wonderful in a time where so much is being lost and torn down. Cook, collage, create. Fifth, Make space for others to be in a different place than you. This can be hard. This means extending grace for ourselves and for one another. Finally, don't be afraid to do things that are so big that others will say it's not possible. This will give us all hope. Friends, it's okay to be wounded. This is the truth. And it's also okay to say that we want all of this to be the start of something else together because we are in this together. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Reverend Nicole. So I'm gonna take the leap from there. Uh, I, I think my, my parallel story was starting off as, as I'm representing mental health partners and a mental health professional, but I started the story the same way as, as me, as the person on that Monday who wanted to hope that maybe it wouldn't be that bad and then cried a lot. And it wasn't until the next day when my mental health professional hat came back on and I was like, oh no, we're the mental health center where the mass shooting has happened. We're the community mental health center. So I'm gonna talk about how did we respond and how do we respond to help our community heal and build off of what Nicole was saying, which I loved. Uh, I wanna start with a little story about my dad. Uh, my dad is, uh, if I had to have one word to describe him, it's big. So he's, a big personality, he's a big presence, he's a big guy, he's like 6'4", like 250 pounds. He, he also happens to be a pastor, so some of you might relate to that. Uh, and, uh, so a few years back, this is after he's retired, which you all know is a fallacy because you know pastors never retire, they just keep preaching. So he was assigned to uh, a vacancy church to cover the vacancy. And I was visiting him in Oklahoma and we were driving to go visit the church. And I was asking dad, you know, tell me about what's going on. And, and he's like, oh, you know, this is like one a church that's in conflict. There's been a lot of inf infighting and he's telling me a little bit about it. And I was just like, ah, ah, this is disgusting. And I, so then I say to my dad, I'm like, so dad, what are you going to do about it? And I'm thinking, oh, he's going to like, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to get this taken care of and show these people. And then my dad says to me, I'm going to love them. I'm going to love them. I, I could have blown me away with a feather because I was just like, not what I thought my dad would say. And to me, it's like the perfect example of how do we help our community heal? You know, at this church, it was the conflict and that that was the trauma, the, the fighting between them. But for us today, you know, it's all those things that Nicole talked about, including this most recent shooting where it's like, we need care, we need compassion and we need community. And so as the mental health center responding and trying to help our whole community with this, uh, Thankfully, and also sadly, we have a lot of partners to help us because in our state, we have other mental health centers who have already had to do this. And so they've been advising us, coaching us. There's also a disaster uh, programming at the state level that's been working with us. 
um, even one of the women who was at, who was like the lead for after the shooting at Columbine is volunteering at our center and guiding us through this process. So one of the first things that at, we've learned after this uh, kind of thing that happens in a community is it's very confusing. And I, I called it trauma brain for myself. It's like hard for us to think or remember things. And so they create a resource center and they bring everything together. So I do wanna try and screen share. I think I'm a co-host. Um, let's try it. Am I sharing? I think I'm sharing. Yes. All right, this is a picture of the resource center, which right now is located right next to the King Supers on the second floor of the Chase Bank. And when it first stood up, it, the Colorado's victim advocate and actually the FBI's victims advocates are the ones who start helping organize it. And the overall model that we use and we call it disaster response is not a therapy, but it's called psychological first aid. And lay people can get trained in this. Uh, you can go to the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. They have like a six hour training on psychological first aid at our agency. We're doing them in more like a two, two and a half hour training right now to get some of our staff trained in it because it's different. It's not therapy. And it's really like, how do I provide that care, that comfort and that action? And so the, I wanted to show the picture of the resource center because I think it actually illustrates some of the concepts of psychological first aid that we're using. So the first thing when, when, well, okay, so I'm going to use the word victim, even though it, I don't think it fits totally. But so the, if the victim comes to the center, uh, there's people at the front door that are working them. And then they are, so that's the first step is like contact and engaging them. You're here, you're at the right place, you're welcome. And then the next concept is like safety and comfort. So you can see this is like in the middle, there's some couches. Normally this is where the comfort dogs are. And I'm gonna show a picture of them in a minute, but people can just come and hang out. There's, you know, there's kind of a nice atmosphere. The, the other acronym I like from psychological first aid, it's called NAP. That doesn't mean take a nap while I'm talking. NAP stands for being a non-anxious presence. So a lot of it is, is like, you're co-regulating, you're kind of speaking limbic system to limbic system for like, I'm okay, I've got this and you're okay and we're gonna help you through this. So that is part of the approach that you try and convey in the environment and in, in how we are as a person when we're interacting with folks who have just gone through a trauma. So the other thing that's here is, you can't actually see it in this picture, but there's like a, a whole shelf full of snacks. There's a cooler full of waters and sodas. So that's when somebody comes in, some of their basic needs can be taken care of too. Get, getting cared for, that piece. Here, I wanna, yeah, I wanna stop sharing a minute and then I'm gonna share my, my other cute picture. So I think part of our comfort and creating that environment have been the comfort dogs. And these folks have come from all over the United States because there are limits on how much the dog can work. And many of these people are volunteers. And so maybe they, they come for a week. Uh, so th this day there was a big crew of dogs. <laughs> you never know. Like, there's a Rottweiler there yesterday. So, you know, you kind of get the whole range. And for some people, this has been you know, that animal supported therapy piece, you know, that they can come and start talking. And maybe that's where uh, the caregiver for the dog is not really supposed to be the counselor, but it does give that person kind of a chance. And then uh, as the counselors on, on board, we will usually come up if somebody starts really being emoting quite a bit. So that's been really great. At M Mental Health Partners, we have our own facilities dog and his name is Fival. So he's come to some of our events as well. Uh, <laughs> he is very beloved. He's super sweet. So then one of the other pieces is also to stabilize and orient. So when the welcome person, uh, the different stations, let me go back to the other thing is a lot of the folks have come in because they just need some hard resources. 
So I gotta share again. So the HR department for King Supers is based out of there. And so they'll have like three or four staff on duty. And so like these uh, kind of cubicles, people can go in. They also provided their vaccinations. So, and then the other pieces of it. So the person will get kind of toured around like, well, it's, you know, do you need to talk to your HR people? So there's about 200 people who worked at that specific King Supers. And then we're also open the center. We were targeting specifically the people who worked at King Supers, the victims' families, um, and anybody who was in the plaza at the time of the shooting. So it could have been any of those other storefronts, the employees or customers who were in that area. Although we do have had we have had other people from the neighborhood come in and use some of the resources. But you can see on the list. Over here, the other things that are also offered is at times we'll have the same thing uh, Reverend Nicole was talking about. We have uh, the, the ear acupuncture or they have uh, masseuses that come in and you can schedule to do those pieces. Uh, we have the mental health partners staff who have been there to offer just brief supportive counseling. And it's again, more along the psychological first aid uh, the Red Cross is there, the victim's advocate, sometimes the veterans affairs person might be there, but mostly it's, there's funds available through victim's advocates. Like one, for example, one person's car was in the parking lot and it got shot up. So it's like what, they're not gonna be able to really use that car. So the victim's advocate was able to get funding for replacement. Uh, the people at King Supers, their HR departments, so they were talking to them about do you wanna keep working in a grocery store? Would you like to be assigned to a different store? So they were helping them relocate or figuring out, um, they were paying them, I think they paid maybe, I don't know if it was a month or two months without working basically for a period of time. And then, so these hits, a lot of the different pieces of getting them oriented, walking them around the space, helping them connect with what's gonna be most supportive to them in that moment. But it's sort of that one-stop shopping idea. So if I'm not thinking that clearly, I could come in there and they could kind of help me get directed for that first step of what, what do I need next? And then part of our role is being that big ear, like the giant ear of I'm listening um, just to hear your story. And then there's a lot of normalizing that these are very normal reactions to a traumatic event. And then if there's, the other piece of this is we're also trying not to try to avoid our little fixer. Sometimes when we really wanna help, but the idea is like the more the person can do and take action, the better, because then it's like, I can do something about this. I do have some control in my life, even though there was this out of control situation. So I do have resources. I can talk to my family. I can connect with my church. I can talk to my friends. I have an old therapist. I, I know how to get connected with my insurance and find a, a therapist. So you want to have them take action as much as possible, as well as you might need to encourage it. So there's the listening, them, them being self-reliant, and it may be other resources. And like we have these little packets of information on the tables because sometimes it's hard to remember everything. And so this has like, here's your resource list. Here's some tips. You know, how do you help your kiddos with these kind of things at different ages? So those hard resources might be something they need because it's hard to retain it when your brain isn't able to concentrate, think as well as it usually is. So that's sort of giving them more information, giving them referrals. Um, I did, uh, I'm just looking at, oh. So some of the other things as far as giving information uh, we've done as an agency to help support our whole community is things like this. Uh, we've been asked to different programs to be on the radio. Uh, Dr. Janine DeAnnabelle has spoken on the radio. She's also kind of nationally known as a trauma expert. Uh, we have our website, which I'm gonna share right now, our little flyer because I'm super excited about so I know that Rich, I think you posted this on this on the site too, right? So that people could go look at the flyer. He's nodding. 
Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I've put all of the links uh, to all of yeah. these uh, things yeah. that you're showing on the website. Yeah. Okay, great. So here's our most recent updated uh, uh, mental health partner specific response. So we are part of the resource center and that's actually something that we will be taking on fully as the lead on, and we've taken more and more of that on. Uh, and we will be moving to a different site that's a little further away from the King Supers because sometimes that's too traumatic for people to come to that exact site. Uh, and we will have that open for a year and we're gonna be hiring a supervisor for that and a couple clinicians so that and that will open up to the whole community and that will be advertised probably end of June. King Super has been great to work with. They actually are doing the remodeling in that space so we can make it that comfortable trauma-informed site. And we will continue with some of these other resources like the massage, the acupuncture, the counseling, the touching base. Um, so that resource center will continue. And then one of the things we've done is our trauma center, Moving Beyond Trauma, We've offered to do free counseling for those people directly in that were on the site during the shooting. So again, that we, we have limited resources, so we're not able to do it for the whole community. We do serve mostly people with Medicaid and Medicare as a safety net organization, but we are also opening up the doors to the King Super staff, the family members of those who were killed in the shooting, and anybody else who was on site in Table Mesa during that, that time period. Uh, but we, what we've also done is we've offered four free uh, support groups. And those are a little less, they're throughout the community in Boulder. They're a little less formal. You don't have to become an official client. It's, you know, so then it is easier for people to get some care without like going through the whole process of an assessment and then getting assigned. And that might be enough for, for many people just to be together with others and help talk about what's going on and how are they managing the symptoms from the trauma. And then we have trainings that we're doing in the community. We have our walk-in crisis center and the, the ongoing crisis line that we've always had. But this is the part I'm excited about. My resilience website, we just added this. I was like, oh, what's the, I just saw it before I did the training with you got all and I was like oh so I went in there so many people might be hesitant to seek out help but this is sort of a self-help way of doing it so you can go to this website and they'll be like here's three different breathing activities or if you're having prob problems sleeping here's three different things you're wondering if you need to go into for counseling here's kind of a little way of figuring that out so it's you know a little it's fairly simple not a ton of information, but it's sort of a first step if somebody wants to have help. And then we talked about the individual and then we're also collecting funds for that. I'm gonna stop sharing that. And then a few other things we've done to help our community. Our, our community of first responders are outstanding and there was, I don't know if it's 25 or 26 agencies responded that day. So all of these officers and first responders were there. And as to have Officer Tally's loss of life is just, I think another deep reminder for them and, and for their families. And so some of the things we've done is uh, Janine has gone and met with them with Fival. And then we have offered so one, uh, one thing that might be healing for people is we actually help people do a walkthrough of the King Supers and we had a separate day for the, for the officers. Now, now for some people that wouldn't be healing, but for other people that was. So there was a choice to do it and we you know, had a whole organized way of doing it. And again, advised by some of our other colleagues who have been through these things that you know, we kind of prepped families, we prepped individuals if they were doing it or the officers when it was their day. And then we went with them and then we had extra staff available if anybody wanted to talk or debrief. We had five of our dog along. And sometimes that's just easier to have the dog where they can come up and pet the dog. And then you're like, how are you feeling <laughs> while they're talking? Uh, so that's a pretty intense thing to, to do the ride along with when people. And so 
and I'm, I'm hoping that was productive in people's healings. And you know what, each person I think as uh, Nicole was saying, ha has a different journey for their healing path. And so you're trying to do like what's right for them. Uh, the other things like they've done is King Super sponsored a big picnic for the 200 staff and their families. And again, it was sort of like, hey, you know, we're all going through the shared thing and we can still find joy and celebrate. Bring your kids, had all sorts of games. Uh, last weekend, we had an expo just for the first responders and their families. And it was at the CU Auditorium. And so balloons all over the basketball court, kids playing basketball, uh, free food, all these prizes. I thought it was a little ironic. Like I was supposed to do a little TED talk like this on, on trauma and nobody came to it. I thought, yeah, they don't want to talk about this. They just want to play today. And I was like, that's okay. You know, whatever they need that day. And we just wanted to, you know, appreciate them and love on them a little bit. And, and it, I, I do want them to get help because I think the accumulation of trauma after trauma can be pretty intense and it does build up and it, we do hold it and it's going to come out some way. So it might be, you know, might be my ulcer. It might be my back pain. It might be my drinking, you know, so it might be my marriage. So I, I'm still encouraging people. Uh, this just makes sense that if you kind of get stuck on the, it's normal to have the trauma reaction, but if you're stuck on it more than four to six weeks, then it's probably time to get help. Because better to do it sooner than later before all those neural pathways get just built in and the habits are built in and you're trying to overcome now this really bad coping strategy that I developed as, as my reaction. So encouraging sooner than later is part of what we also have been doing. Uh, a couple other examples just from, I just, I don't work at the resource center very much and I do that on purpose because <laughs> I'm still trying to do my other full-time job. And so I'm just doing one shift a week. And we've tried to just say that to everybody. And the shift is just two hours. And it's like, I can do my two hours. And, and sometimes it's a shift where nobody's coming in for mental health something. And sometimes it, sometimes there is someone or two people. So you don't really know. I, I was going to share actually our data. This is kind of interesting. Uh, so we started running the front desk. Oops, that's dogs. Wait. <laughs> so we have data from the last month when we started running the front desk and we don't take anybody's names we just ask them like why are they here so this is just so you can see a little bit where do I want you guys to go I like this so since April 13th 429 people have come into the resource center so that's, you know, about in the last month, this is from um, Monday's report. And of those, there was 81 new people. And I think that's part of the lesson about everybody's going to do this in their own time. And that that might be the first time, whether it's six weeks later, eight weeks later, or eight months later, when they are like, yeah, I actually need to talk to somebody or I could use some resources. So, and that 80% of people are still coming back. A lot of them are, a third of them are the King Super employees. Others were witnesses or customers and other are community members from that, probably from that neighborhood mostly. And then this is the resources. So I was talking about how we're using our psychological first aid. These are the new people. So a lot of the new people were still King Super folks. A lot of them were coming in to see the support dogs. And I don't know if I should be taking it personally. More people came to see the dogs and they came to see me, <laughs> but mental health counselors after the puppies. Uh, sometimes they're coming in for other resources, the victim's compensation, coming in for the massage or acupuncture. So those are the new people. And then the next chart is the total. These are the people doing follow-up visits and a lot of them are coming back for the King Super Human Resources. It was the COVID vaccinations, which they, I think probably were doing the two time one. Uh, and again, the second, the dogs are coming in second. <laughs> Com victims compensation. So some of those hard resources is like, how do I actually get through this time when I'm not able to work? Uh, and then mental health counseling, 
the massage, the acupuncture, those kind of information. And then to end up, I'll just give you a few examples of some of the folks I did talk to. Uh, one of the ladies I talked to was um, thankfully not on site, but she was like, you know, basically her cat was sick. And so she didn't end up, she would have been in the store probably during the shooting, you know, it, and her daughter was in the store like the hour before it happened. So, cause they live in the neighborhood and, and people in that neighborhood, if it's your store, you go there, you just drop in and grab one thing or you're, Teenagers hang out there. That's their hangout. I was so glad it was spring break. That was like one thing I was super thankful about. And so she talked about how each member of her, her family, like the, the spouse wanted to go be a superhero and save one. And the one kid was having nightmares, but not talking about it. And the one kid wanted to go out and advocate. And she was, she had a breakdown at work. And she's like, I've always had, her psychological theory was we should just be ignoring this why would you spend time focusing on really intense emotional things and you know as she was crying into the dog and I'm talking to her I was like well I think this is actually one of those times when we're learning <laughs> we it's going to be helpful and you, you probably all might want to do it and she already had she already had her insurance and she already knew that but I think it was also the nudge of challenging her own way of approaching you know icky feelings You're like you just don't spend time on them. You just keep going. And so I'm hoping, you know, this is one thing when you work at one of these centers, you don't get to hear the end of the story. You know, you just get to be a part, a little piece of it. Uh, another gentleman came in and he's uh, had lived in the community and worked in that store in the past and now lives in a different state. And he had stopped by. And one of the things he was doing was he had the recording of the 911 video and he kept, I mean, the call and he kept listening to it over and over again. And then he was saying, you know, and then I cry and I'm upset. And, and then I would just said, so is that helping you? Is that helping you process and kind of gain mastery over it? And he goes, I don't think so. I think it's just upsetting me. And then, and then I was like, okay, well then maybe that's something you stop doing. I mean, overall advice after a trauma is for us to really limit how much we are taking in from the media because it is overwhelming and it's like we can only take so much and so he was like yeah that's probably a good idea and I was like yeah that's and I'm not telling him what to do I was just trying to help him sort out is this a helpful strategy and then I also said to him you know you're a part of this community you can come back anytime even if you don't live in this state when you're visiting. And I think that, that like you're, we are all going through this together was the other message. Uh, this, this last week, the gentleman I talked with is a different example of somebody who has pretty severe mental health issues before all this, and then on top of it to be exposed to the trauma. And, and that's probably even more complex when you're trying to help somebody. And, and for him, pretty much what I just did was listen. So that psychological first aid might have like these eight different strategies and it's not like in a certain order and it's not necessarily that I'm trying to do all nine of them. It might be like just what pieces of this is gonna be right for that person today. And so that's kind of what I had to say. I'm, I think we are open to discussion and taking some questions from everybody. Let's see, I'm just reading in the chat. A friend of mine proposed having different faith leaders, elders do energy clearing, healing rituals at King Super before it reopens. Yeah, the schedule is for it. To, they're gonna start remodeling probably in another month and probably opening in the fall. Um, could be a healing gathering for the community. I'm thinking Nicole and Susan could be good networkers for getting, so uh, Nicole and I, she's assigning us homework. <laughs> That we to do. I think another thing that's going to be tricky for our community is this memorial wall that is a very natural outpouring that happens after these events. That's so my I, question because it's gonna it's supposed to come down on the thirtieth, and I would love to hear your thoughts on is there something planned? 
and or are they literally just going to tear it down or do you know anything about that? So I know that our community, um, the History Museum has been going along and taking off different pieces and that they're going to have then an exhibit. So as a way of saving, kind of saving part of this is sadly our history, but also it's incredibly meaningful and important. So that has been happening and that is part of the plan. I think it's the city right now who is supposed to go and you know, because if you bring live flowers, of course, after a certain amount of time, they aren't very appealing or attractive. And so they actually have to go through every few days and take out things that have wilted and passed. And so that's already happening. And like, even like the gentleman I was talking to this week, he goes, I wish they'd take that down. So again, for each, some people it's been super helpful and a place to go and have a memorial. And for, for him, he's like, I don't want to see it. So, and for, so other people, it's like too much, but I, I think, yeah, I think there might be like, how do you have a communal? And I, I don't know for sure. I know like at other King Supers across the state that people have like kind of a memorial, like they even are bringing flowers to other King Supers after this happens. So there is that connection with the, this is my King Super. So yeah, it's tricky. Other people have thoughts on that? I realized I was talking and I might have not unmuted myself. So no. I apologize. Um, I, I um, have lots of thoughts and I just wanted to repeat what, I, what you didn't hear, which is I wanted to thank you both for sharing your personal story as much as also your, in your professional roles in serving people. Um, there's those two pieces, the, the personal component and the professional component. And, and for those of us who do brief counseling, uh, sure, it's important to be able to listen, to be there. But I think also there's a, a heart component. And in, in this um, possible conversation about interface combining spirituality and psychotherapy, oftentimes one or the other is left out of the whole person approach. And sometimes it's the heart component uh, that's represented like words of compassion or caring or you know, just offering the, to pet the dog. What is it we're really generating? We're generating something that we can't really describe. And that spiritual component is the stuff that goes beyond words and it's beyond a technique or a tool. And so um, to, to have this uh, opportunity today to consider how both work together. There's an intervention, there's a professional role of support and, and providing services and, and um, King Supers has gone way beyond uh, in donating all their food to the food banks uh, that they, when they cleaned out that store. A uh, huge donation of, of uh, products to people who are in need of food and all the services they're providing. I'm gonna let uh, someone else in. And, and then uh, on the, the heart, the spiritual side of it is, is invisible. And, and I wanna bring that question to the two of you to think about out loud together to talk about is when we talk about the community, uh, that King Super store was one of those uh, meeting places where people would run into each other because it was a community center. But also the church, at least in the old days, provided a place to come to on Sunday or if it was a sangha, a yoga meditation group, or if it was a um, uh, Jewish uh, synagogue or w whatever faith uh, that we might be affiliated with, it was a gathering place. And so now if we think about the gathering places, the King Supers is on, taken offline. Uh, the church provides that for those people who attend church, but then there's a greater community, the Boulder community, not just um, Martin Acres at, in the Table Mesa area, but all of us in Boulder, and then all of us in the state of Colorado. It's Now we've joined that uh, roster of, of um, the Aurora shootings and um, right. um, Columbine. And now we we've, we've sadly have a mark of history that uh, puts us in a different community. So let me come back to try to formulate the question is, is how do we 
bring what heart provides or what spirituality provides to a community where it goes beyond the boundary of the physical location. Uh, what, what, what is it that either of you can think about on the bigger scale of what our community means and how do we join together uh, to provide some healing in that way? I'll start with that one. So one of the vigils I attended um, was in the big grassy area behind the Catholic church, that park. Um, and um, it was just sort of led by whoever came to the middle. And um, we did some singing and there was some kind of call and response. And at one point, some people led us in howling um, and I was so moved by it. And just um, to your point, Barry, there it's something that we felt, right? That we, that those of us who sought out to be a part of that circle and what was so beautiful about it, which is kind of different from the church in a sense, is that there's not that baggage, that spiritual or religious baggage, right? None of us were coming there seeking something religious but something inspirational perhaps um but just to be a part of that shared energy where everyone is welcome whoever wants to lead goes to the center i wept i sang i left feeling literally feeling like i was part of something bigger so i think just to your point there are things that we can do together whether it be crying over a dog while you know someone sitting next to you that um that is what we each bring the energy we bring um and then when we're together it's just far beyond what any of us could ever create on our own so thank you for lifting up that invisible magic thank you susan do you have something to add to that uh, i was thinking about what nicole had said during our interview about the phrase bold or strong. I think the positive side of it is, is it, it is this idea that sadly through this trauma, we actually have shared it. And I feel the same way about COVID, like at, for the world, we actually all as a human <laughs> beings have gone through COVID together. That's pretty unusual to have that much of a shared experience. And this microcosm of like, oh, I, this is my community and you're in my community and we've shared this sadness together and this pain that, that there is something, I think that is what the bold or strong means. I think, Nicole, you were worried about if we're saying we're strong, it doesn't mean actually we need help. <laughs> so, so the counter of that is bold or strong is like, and is, I'm strong enough to ask for help when I need it and that I don't have to do this alone. So I think I, I'm I'm interested in what anybody else's ideas too because I don't I don't have a great answer on this. I I think I'm going to preach about that Boulder Strong at some point because as I said, my the thing that I don't like about it is it makes it seem like, you know, even if you're feeling if you're in a ball crying and feeling just put the sign out in your yard and all shall be well, you know. Um, but to your point, I, I think it's Susan. It's more about collectively, we have found a strength in our weakness, so to speak. So I understand the spirit of it, but I also was kind of like, oh no, what if we're weak and fragile and we're in a bad place and we need to do better by one another? It just it kind of struck me the wrong way in terms of when when it just landed right immediately is. Um, another hashtag, and like you're saying, Barry, now we're part of another terrible club. I have more things I would like to bring up, but I also want to turn it up to those of us who are listening in, uh, Rich, and um, we have a small crowd here, so I wanted to um, be a community dialogue, not just an interview. Anyone else who's listening in or on the screen here want to join in? I'll uh, respond to that, Barry. It, it's or Spence. Spence and And thank you for helping me make the connection this morning. I wish that uh, more people had responded to the pick of the day instead of 21 folks. 
uh, one of the things I learned from both Susan and Nicole was um, the outreach that King Supers has offered to the community. I also learned about the Resource Center, which I never knew it was there as a neighbor. Um, I don't go to that bank. Um, I knew someone that uh, offers massage there, but it, it has been a, an amazing resource under the radar. And I, uh, I wish that more people who need to avail themselves of the center would learn of it. I just, there are 10,000 people who, who live in this immediate neighborhood south of the, of the 40th latitude. And uh, I'm sure that as our two speakers have said today, there are many out there who uh, might be uh, helped and find benefit from the resources that you all offer. Um, I don't know how you get word out to that unseen, unknown majority of community people. So that's an interesting challenge for all of us. Yeah, I agree. I think the initial focus has been on those most directly impacted. And when we move next month, it will definitely be advertised widely that it, for the whole community. And I think if you know people, like maybe that's the way to say, oh, I heard they had the comfort dogs over there. You want to go visit, you know? So like it, that, that might be, we can ally that way, you know? Can I go with you? If we have other people who we know we want to get connected with resources, so just start thinking about it. So yeah, that we are definitely going to make a bigger push. It is really hard when you first have this. Of course, you're not planning for this. I mean, you plan for this, but you don't plan for this. And so to get the response going, it's, you know, it's a scramble. Like the first day we had three meetings with the senior managers of, you know, and who's going to actually take this on and has to drop their actual job and become the full-time person doing this. And then everybody else has to volunteer to get in and really make it work. So it, it is quite a lift to, to manage on top of your regular jobs. And then what about the middle school and senior high school kids that found that gathering place their second home? Is there any outreach to those uh, younger folks who also may be suffering the trauma? Yeah, I, that's a good question. We, we do have in conjunction with uh, the school district, BVSD, uh, prevention interventionists that are in most of the high schools and then some of the elementary schools. But yeah, definitely the, you know, the Fairview crowd, they, they hang out there all the time, you know, go get their coffees and all that. So I think it is a big piece. And that's why I was actually super thankful. I feel a little overwhelmed by the potential demand already uh, for mental health. And that, so, they, so that idea of even having that website to say like, oh, here's something that anybody can go to because I don't, we can't possibly see everyone. And yet there's gonna be lots of people who need some level of support. So it might be like, oh, I can read this article. I can listen to the story online. I can read the book. I can go to the website. So I can do the support group. So I want that more like the menu that's a range of services that's gonna help different people at different spots. And then some people who are probably more stuck, I need to come in for individual, whether that's at mental health partners or any of the awesome practitioners in the community. Well, Susan, you're lifting up, getting me to something that's just been really hard too, or even before the pandemic is just, just the fact that mental health care in this country is separate from the body, like your head and your eyes somehow aren't a part of any kind of health care and that we have to offer this separate thing and these, you know, extenuating circumstances and, um, and just kind of resonating with your overwhelm in terms of, in my context, often faith communities are the front lines of free um, mental health care, trying to resource people, directing what they need. And so just just to echo a hope for a different kind of care um, really soon around mental health care in this country. And I see Lynn's got her hand up. Does anyone have a feeling of what really happened with Alyssa, the perpetrator? I, I actually have avoided the news, so I don't have a, 
I don't have any opinion on it, <laughs> so I don't know. Do you know he was from Syria? Uh, I wasn't sure if he was American born or he somebody who had moved here. He, he came here when he was three. Yeah. With uh, 10 brothers and sisters and his parents. Yeah, I mean, Lynn, I think part of what's so complicated about this is knowing what's what you know and and as i understand it the information that the authorities do know um has you know they've revealed very little to protect the the case um so maybe we'll know more with time i've heard all kinds of theories about you know was boulder specifically targeted um because how different we are than the other counties um i've heard uh, uh he just had a mental break and took the first exit so you know i mean depending on um, who you talk to, I suspect this hey, is one of those things that we could go down all kinds of rabbit holes. Go ahead, Susan, were you going to say something? No, my neighbor's knocking on the door. So I was trying to. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Zoom life, Zoom oh, life. Hold on a second. Lynn, did you have anything more to add to that or any particular question you were wrestling with? I know I did address um, the bullying. That was one thing I had read um, that was one theory that that led to some earlier kind of mental health crises. Yeah. Um, well, I just, I haven't heard from, you know, I guess I'm an iconoclast, but for me, there's a lot of meat in this situation, you know, and, and um, I don't know anything either, but I guess I just feel kind of alone by myself, but I'm the only one that feels like, Hey, Syria, a lot of things have happened in Syria, the Yemen war, the Middle East, the whole thing that the, the, um, what our recall where he came from was the head of ISIS. Um, I mean, do these things just not mean anyone, anything to anyone? Am I the only one that is curious and reads about it and and wonders if then i'd like to jump in and say that your question and your concern is common that we project onto the unknown trying to find answers or trying to understand make sense of things and we're limited with only the little tidbits and and project onto the blank screen like we have imax projectors on a blank screen here and so um it can really become vivid, but we really don't know. And um, but I, you know, I mean, I, I think about these things in terms of I don't want to think in terms of that. personal grief and and loss and how it affects you personally and and how yeah, I, I, how it's not that it's I don't want to think I I never will believe that there is actually evil in the world. I will never believe that. I can't do that. So even Hitler. <laughs> I, I, I think back on a little bit, I'm, I'm kind of jumping from off from what you're talking about, Linda, but as far as I, for me, what a concern is because I, there are things that also continue to impact the, the community. So when there's the trial that's gonna be coming up, that's gonna be like just another like when you think about that, as you're talking about grief, like those waves, like, so maybe there's like little things, like just when we got interviewed for the radio interview and the person said, this is the two month anniversary, I almost broke out crying. Cause I was like, and I didn't plan on that. I just was like, oh, you know, that rush of emotion that you don't have control over. So those triggers, the, the fact that even since our shooting event that there's been several other in the community so every time there's another shooting then that can be another trigger and another layer on on people's trauma and as they're trying to cope and manage the symptoms so i i think trying to figure it out is part of can i get some mastery over this can i understand it maybe it's maybe there's i don't know what to understand i the other thing i get a little worried about is during some of the shooting people are like well, it's a mental health problem. Well, I'm also working on a, 
we are working on trying to get over stigma and we want people to come in. And if it, people start saying everything is mental health, then I'm also like, yeah, everything is mental health. But I also don't want people to think like, all, a lot of us have mental health problems and most of us aren't acting out in violent ways. In fact, the statistics show that people getting mental health services are more likely to be victims than they are to be perpetrators of violent acts. And there's also statistics that show frequently with these kind of shootings, there is some mental health component. So for me, that's actually a concern as we're working in our communities. Serena, do you wanna jump in? I guess I, I have a kind of different question. Um, I'm somebody who lives um, in a neighborhood that's not terribly close to that King Supers. I've been there many times, but it's not someplace that I went to more than a handful of times a year. And I guess my question is from a spiritual point of view, from a mental health point of view, what I, I contemplate that store opening again. And I contemplate whether I will go, whether I should go. And if I do go, what kind of spirit I will go in. And because it's not part of my day-to-day, week-to-week pattern, it would be very easy for me to just continue to see it as that place, the scary King Supers, which I found myself calling it a few days ago. Um, and just avoid it like the plague. Um, however, I'm also concerned that going there and just trying to have a quote unquote normal shopping experience, which with all of its American consumeristic kind of mindless connotations, that also seems very strange and disrespectful to, to the reality of what happened there that day so uh, what would be a mindful way of entering that space again I, Serena I would like to think that King Supers and the city is going to um, provide a memorial to visit so it's not visiting this uh, site where a tragedy happened but it's honoring um, the people who lost their lives. And so there's more than just uh, going to this, they're gonna remodel that store completely inside and outside. And it won't be, there won't be much left that will remind you of what uh, you used to um, see and, and feel when you're in that store. It's gonna be upgraded uh, big time is my, is my guess. But I hope that the memorial is something that we can all visit even without having to shop and, and to, to acknowledge it and to bring uh, something of our selves um, to connect with, uh, to acknowledge and to come away with something um, greater. So we're not at a loss, but we, we gain something from the experience. That would be my uh, two cents worth. Anyone else want to say something about that? Well, I've pondered the same thing, like how, how will I shop there? But just personally, it's just such a weird dynamic that without that, we just have like this super expensive Whole Foods, which adds to my rage. So it's just such a weird feeling that like, with that, and some of you have pointed to the symbolism, the store kind of had, it had a symbolic um, role in the community, it turns out, of sort of being like, and I'm kind of, I've been here two and a half years, but at least for this part of Boulder, it was sort of like a vestige of a middle class thing. And um, as the plaza changes, I mean, before, as I understand it, before Whole Foods was a, um, was the Luckies, it was a, a thrift store, which is a totally other, so, so I just ponder what that plaza represents for Boulder as a changing place to, to your point about what it means to go there or not. Um, it's just fascinating how 
just how symbolic some a building right and a play a place that held um interactions it, it's just um i appreciate what you're what you're asking serena yeah i mean i think again this kind of goes back to individual like some people have talked a little bit about like i want to reclaim it like this is this isn't the shooters this is ours and other people are like i'm not going there again so and I, I think you're right. I think there'll be some memorial piece. And some of it is like, I just want to go to the grocery store and have it be normal again, you know? So all of those things are like in there. Yeah, and I, I think avoidance is, you know, one of the responses to trauma. Yeah. And, you know, with the clients that I deal with with trauma, you know, um, one of the things that you want to make sure that they're able to do is to go to those places and do those things that they were avoiding. Um, and they'll never be the same, of course, but um, because trauma changes us, but uh, you know, at least that they, they don't feel like the trauma has power over them by having them avoid things. And so I think it's, I think it's important to at least process that part. And speaking of changing things, um, I've talked to some folks who talk about, um, you know, this event as, as um, kind of Boulder losing its, its innocence. You know, we were those places where, you know, one of those places where this was not going to happen. And now that's not true any longer. And so I wonder if you have any thoughts or ideas about, um, you know, having Boulder strong mean that we don't lose what we might have lost, that the trauma doesn't reorganize us and make us you know, respond in violent ways, for example, or try something that would be clearly not bolder in response to what happened here. Anyone we haven't heard from want to share some wisdom? Is it possible to be Go back to seven square miles surrounded by reality, the way we used to think of the Boulder as a protected community. I, I Spence, was thinking... you've been uh, involved with Boulder for a long, long time, and uh, I wonder uh, what your thoughts are about how Boulder's changed in, in your perspective, from your perspective, that is. This is your moment, Spence. You've been asked to speak to the squares. Thank you. <laughs> you um, came here in 57. When, when we came in 57, it was a different town. It was a small town with a big university, although it wasn't, it was only half the size of what it is today. Um, the town has changed dramatically, many ways in good ways. Um, I think that there is, I think people in the media tends to advertise the negative features of a place or a town. Um, when we went to Australia and Taiwan on the front page was Jean Benet Ramsey, the little girl that was, her life was taken and, um, Maybe that was another milestone of the bubble having been broken or burst. Um, I, I think the town, I like that metaphor of going to Oklahoma and loving whoever is about there to meet me. I, I walk out the door every day, loving the town, remembering what it was like uh, 45 or 50 or 60 years ago. And I see people continuing to strive to uh, do their best for the most part. People are working very hard <clears throat> in their restaurant, in their jobs, in their churches. And that gives you hope. At the same time, when an incident like this has happened to us, um, we realize that we took some of these things for granted. We took Boulder for granted the way she was a long time ago, but she's different now. 
And in some ways she's better now because there's a little more diversity, not enough, but there's a little bit more. And when you go past the place of tragedy, I think, I guess the thing that when I go past an intersection where a bicyclist has just been killed, that is a traumatic moment for me. And I, I think to myself, I grieve for that loss, for the family that was lost, the loved ones that still remain, but I still continue to cycle through that intersection and trying to be more careful, trying to give messages to fellow cyclists to be careful, doing whatever I can. But to answer the question about the town changing, it has changed dramatically. And uh, we just have to keep finding out if we can grow in size and grow in quality at the same time. I thought that when the town passed 100,000, we were um, going into a new arena of challenge because we knew that the quality of services would decrease. We knew the, co the cost of services would decrease whether it was response time for the ambulance or the fire truck. But you hope that some of the good things that are happening will counterbalance the troubling things and the trauma that we face in our daily lives. <clears throat> well, I think Thank you. It's nice to have your perspective on this. From something, I mean, Everyone has, you know, lot, losses, people that have died. And I, I like to feel like those deaths are not relegated to space time. And they're far beyond that. So they're everywhere, part of everything then. And it's something you have to rectify in yourself all the time. So a, a place doesn't really inherit that essence so much. Um, but I, I knew one of those people actually that was um, shot in the, in that, um, Scene. And to me, it's kind of ironic because I haven't been vaccinated yet. And she set up my um, Medicare, you know, my insurance policy. And I never see the doctor, but the first time that I did see the doctor in March was it was such a bad experience that I'm really questioning if I'm ever going to go to the doctor again at all. And I didn't even, I had a Zoom meeting. So sorry to hear that, Lynn. Yeah, it's kind of a terrible experience. And, and, so and sorry. I, I don't want to be in that position, especially now, because I'm compelled to have this vaccination that it's not just going to Safeway where you get the vaccination. It's a matter of having, you know, it, to me, it's an, it, it is some, a big deal, you know, having a vaccination and, and it's the, the kind of irony of, of her having set up, I'm trying to process that more than anything, but yeah, it, um, and as to, I, I just want to understand things. I'm just a really curious person. And I think a lot of people, you know, basically are very curious. So I think that's the important thing is to maintain that level of curiosity. Lynn, I love that. And in our community, we often talk about turning to wonder instead of judgment. 
as a more generative place to be. So instead of, I wonder why that person's being, you know, that instead of just saying that person's being a jerk, you know, you can say, I wonder what happened to them today that led them to that. I mean, curiosity is a, an extremely generative posture in the world. And I love hearing you have more people being guided by that. I guess time to cut this off. Mm -hmm. It's going to long. I get in trouble for it. But I, I <laughs> thanks that it, that it. I appreciate you saying that. Well, this has been a Excellent. great conversation, everyone. Unless there's another burning question here, maybe we could pause and, and uh, thank our um, guest presenters, Susan and, and uh, Nicole. And again, thank Rich for setting this up and bringing this conversation and, and, and these uh, reflections to Interface. And uh, this session, as you know, is recorded and I'll send every, I'll put the link to this recording uh, on our Interface webpage under this uh, session. And um, so if uh, it's something that you want to pass along to other people, it'll be available. Any other closing thoughts, uh, Susan or, or Nicole or Rich? Thank you. Thank you all. I was I was just trying, I can't remember the name of this. I had to look it up. I was thinking of the pottery where it's made out of broken pottery and then they put it we back together. You. Yeah, the gold. Potty. We see yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that is what I was thinking about us because it's beautiful in the broken places. Well, let nice. that be nice. our final words. Beautiful wow. in the broken places. Susan, I love that. Thank you so much, Susan and Nicole and Rich. And um, <laughs> that's amazing that you just spoke about a broken pot because I was just hearing about one yesterday <laughs> yeah about gaza and mm -hmm. kind of one of those okay thank you uh see you next month for those of you who can join us again <laughs>